let's uh, meet the panelists, of course. We're all uh, backstage and ready to go. Um, uh, first off, uh, in the role of Shirley Maisel, uh, Caroline Aaron, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> In the role of Moisha Maisel, a man I have worked on the road for with many years, ladies and gentlemen, Kevin Pollack. <laughs> As Rose Weissman, ladies and gentlemen, Marin Hinkle. As Joel Mazel, Michael Zegan. As the delicate and wilting Susie Meyerson, Miss Alex Borstein. As Abe Weissman, Tony Shaloub. <laughs> and as Miriam Midge Maisel. The amazing Rachel Brosnahan. Uh, uh, and also now, uh, executive producer of the show, uh, Daniel Palladino, ladies and gentlemen. and the creator, executive producer, and genius behind everything you've seen here, Amy Sherman Palladino, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, before I start asking questions, as a comedian, it is a, a huge <laughs> relief to see a show that gets the process of stand-up comedy right, the, the process of creating jokes, testing them, finding a persona on stage, and all of the personal stuff that goes along with that really, really nailed that, you know? And, and also just as a fan of that period of America and that time of New York, getting all that stuff really right. So I'm gonna start with you, Amy. Oh, uh, dear. Yeah. Um, look, you wore the hat, you get the attention. I did wear you know. the hat. So um, what, uh, what made you go, I want to explore this world, I want to, you know, see these characters and stuff? Well, I was out of work, and... Oh. Um... <laughs> okay, next question. Uh, Rachel, okay. how did you... And see, uh, and, and Bergdorf said, can you please go back to work, because we don't want to see you here anymore. Um, <laughs> I, uh, uh, my father was a stand-up, so I grew up uh, not necessarily involved in his world, because he, as so many things that you know, add to your years of therapy later on. He was a New York comic who talked about, regaled me with the idea of Greenwich Village and the Catskills, but decided to raise me in the San Fernando Valley. And, and <laughs> I, I, if you know me, if you've met me, I'm not really a San Fernando Valley kind of gal. And it was, 
It was just a, a but, but you know, the, the stories and him and his friends would sit around in the backyard and smoke odd smelling cigarettes and uh, make each other laugh and, and, and talk about the old days. And it just felt like a world that was uh, colorful and interesting and, you know, in my mind, like, everyone in the Greenwich Village was smart. There were no dumb people there. They're all in the San Fernando Valley. And, um, <laughs> and, then, uh, and then I thought, you know, so why don't I do something like that? But I just turned my father, who was a six-foot-four bald Jew from the Bronx, into Rachel Brosnahan. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Ah. <laughs> That's what you do. Yeah. Um, and that, that, it really sort of started from, it, it felt like a world I wanted to live in. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to do a modern piece again. I didn't want to ever type the word Snapchat in my entire, I just don't, I don't right. want anyone to tweet or twat or, I don't, I don't give a hey, shit now. about any of that. I wanted a time where people could have to get to a telephone and dial mm -hmm. to actually talk to somebody else. I wanted something with some color and I wanted skirts and cars and, and uh, nobody told me how much it was gonna cost until later. <laughs> uh, it costs a lot, <laughs> takes a long time. And she wears clothes that are basically a torture chamber. Like it's just, uh, but it's. Yeah, we're uh, gonna. We're, we'll get to the costuming because the <laughs> costuming on the show is amazing. Staunch. I'm sitting there watching it, going, "Oh my God, that's," you know, it. I, my, my wife and I watch the show. We love it, and I'm going, "Oh my God, that's Jane Jacobs." They're doing, and then she's like, "That skirt is. I want that skirt so bad." So, <laughs> just seeing the, how, um, how much of Amy do you feel like you channel? Did you talk to her at all about? This world, her dad, you're, you are personifying a bald, six foot Jewish comedian, so. She's how playing much? bald. Did you not notice that? I did not, wow. That's why the hats. Oh. Yeah, yeah many hats. No, I mean, I, Amy can attest, and Dan as well, that I asked them about 17,000 questions before yeah. we started. Yeah, it was exactly 17,000. Notebooks full of questions and answers from Amy. Um, but we, we dove in pretty quickly, though. We didn't have a lot of time between auditioning and when we actually started shooting the pilot, it yeah, felt like- because you had to go do a fellow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, it's like, listen, she's got this thing with uh, a James Bond and- uh... <laughs> I did a fellow in, in, a, in a very small theater in with New With James York Bond. With Daniel Craig. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I had, uh, uh, I had to get her out. <laughs> yeah. And it was actually insane. It was like, I had spoken to Amy on the phone. I had memorized hordes and hordes of Shakespeare and was, simultaneously memorizing hordes and hordes of Palladino. Wow. And it was, uh, it was a really, really crazy Very time, even. but we just Very dove even. in. We had like a week of rehearsal. Yeah. Um, I got a crash course in comedy and, and Palladinoisms, and, and we dove right in. Yeah. Never looked back. We, we have not looked back. <laughs> no. Or, or been back to sleep. No. <laughs> Your, okay, the pacing and uh, cinematography on the show, was it designed before you started shooting it to go, let's do these amazing long takes with people walking, you're almost like you're, it's like a filmed play in some cases, yeah. or was that a, a, had, had to, to service the way the dialogue was? Was it planned that way? Because it's, it's stunning to watch some of those scenes going, oh my God, if one person gets one line wrong, four minutes into it, like you feel so yeah. nervous for them watching it. <laughs> I'm sure you all have had that on yours, but like was We've that- We've all been the asshole person? who did it. Yeah. Well, not, <laughs> not only that, like we don't always tell them it's a one -er. no, So don't. the last episode, we were doing a scene with Michael and, and Joel Johnson where they had talk and hit baseballs at the same Woo! time. And all I told them oh, was, yeah. please <laughs> practice playing baseball. Like just, I don't care how you do it, find a little league game or a batting <laughs> cage or mug someone, but pick up a bat and hit something. <laughs> so it's three o'clock in the morning and we're in a park with a mugger and a flasher in the corner, and we're 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 doing it, and we're working out, and we're rehearsing it. And Conky McConkey, who's our genius study cam guy, without McConkey, none of this happens. And I'm pulling him around, and and halfway through, Michael turns to me and he goes, "Is this a oneer?" It was like I don't know, was it eight pages or something like that? I'm like, I, I don't know. <laughs> and then, I don't mind, I'm a girl. I don't know anything. <laughs> And then I drag Conky around a little bit more, and then I'm like, yeah, it's a one, let's go, let's go. So three o'clock in the morning, the last shot of the whole season was him playing baseball with, and, and that, it was involved, like if the ball was wrong, if the bat was wrong, if the words were wrong. Oh my God. 
Wow. Yeah, it, was, I, I, yeah. it was the same with You're the, welcome. It was the same with the initial dance in the Catskills episode. Yeah. That the, scene yeah. gave me so much stress watching that. Yeah. What, cause me too, you, that's what we're here yeah, for. Because not only do you gotta get, you've gotta hit, you have to land at these specific moments for people to give you lines that, oh, God, I got be so able to talk. out And that was that. one shot <laughs> from the very, very beginning all the way through, whipped around, all the way to the end of that, all the way to the end of that scene. And we had and, no rehearsal. No. I didn't have, we had one, one very short rehearsal because something we were shooting too late the night before, and so the dancers rehearsed, but I didn't join them. Right. So we basically rehearsed it the day of, yeah. and then oh. shot this insane wonder. It was crazy, <laughs> but we all got a really good workout in. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, now how much um, stand-up have you watched? Do you watch, to get uh, ready for Midge being on stage, do you watch modern stand-up or do you watch stand-up of that time? Like how much, to just get the rhythms down and everything? Both, especially early on. Um, the, the comedy world was completely foreign to me. I spent many years dying and crying before this show and, and not a lot of True. joke telling, so. Wow. She's um, so cute and they kept tying her up and throwing her in a ditch and. Yeah. <laughs> not She's much. so cute. Like not people yet. are alive till the end. People like that. Yeah. People, so, when girl, people actually do like when girls live. That's it. Well, More girls living in, in 2019. Yeah. Girls live. But uh, yeah, I watched a lot. I watched a lot of Ali Wong and, mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. Like, yeah, isn't she Great. good? And um, I initially, when I first read the script, I know I told you guys this, but I thought that I thought for sure, a hundred percent, that the character was based on Jean Carroll, who I've, was one of the first female stand-ups in 1955, I think is when she really mm -hmm. kind of caught wind. And I watched a bunch of Jean Carroll, you know, she wore beautiful pearls and dresses. And then I came to Amy all proud of myself and I was like, I studied a lot of Jean Carroll. And she was like, what? <laughs> um, Don't do that. You're playing it was my not father. Jean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the opposite Jean of Jean Carroll. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, but, but every once in a while I keep giving myself a crash course. I have a couple friends who do stand up and, and they've been my gurus and lifelines. Oh. And, and I also had, it, it's fortunate that when we start the series, Midge is not a stand up. She's a woman having a prolonged mental breakdown yes. and it's funny. Yeah. And that which was. Is, which leads a lot of people to stand up weirdly enough. That's so that true was also. <laughs> yeah. I have since learned that about stand-up, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We thought that was important, actually, because the, the world of stand-up, as you know, is a very strange world. And it's, and it's hard to capture because it, you think that stand-ups sit around and they're just massively hilarious all the time. But stand-ups are very dark. <laughs> and the reason that you tend to be funny is there's a lot of, uh, you're working out your pain and your shit and your anger on stage while people drink and judge you. And so... <laughs> you leave angry and upset and it's a vicious circle. But so I thought that to, to make the world, because I, I worked at the comedy store for a while, not, not as a comic, but just, just at, at the cover booth. Because no every now and then Mitzi would h hire me and then re remind herself in six months that I wasn't a comic and then fire me. Like, it went on like, like five times. But you would see this cycle of like, of people coming in and psyching themselves out that they were going to fail before they hit the stage and these lovely, sweet men who would come in and say, and joke with me and hi, by the time they hit the stage, they're like, fuck you, like daring the, the audience <laughs> to hate them because yeah. it, it, it was a protection. And we felt like to really make the audience sort of stick with her and understand they have to go through what Midge is going through. Mm -hmm. The point of view has to be somebody who knows nothing about stand-up except that she's seen some shows and she, and she gets dressed up and she goes to the gaslight and it's fun. And, and she doesn't understand what goes into it at all. So as she learns, the audience can learn so that we're not having to say, hey, she's a stand-up, she's got it all together from day one, she walks out, it's perfect. It's so far, it's worked for us. And, and she happens to be very good at what she does. You also pull off some really, yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> you, you also have a lot of fun with, with a lot of the um, internalized self-hatred uh, and defeatism of stand-up. My favorite we being that. the one where Midge goes up at that show and just rips the asses out of all the other male comedians in the room <laughs> and kills. But there's a really interesting line afterward where the club owner gets in her face and he says, you go up there and you shit all over my best guys. If you ever want to work here again, you don't. 
But he says, if, in other words, he, he could have just said, you're fired and you're never coming in here. But he's like, but she fucking killed. Yeah. Like, I need her back. <laughs> so, but I've got to assert myself. That was such a, a, I've seen that so many times in clubs. Like, that was a very real thing of like, you embarrass these guys and yeah, you got a lot of fucking laughs. So listen, like, how do I keep her coming back here? It was so But make that, her feel really bad about it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. How do I still assert myself? That was, I thought that was like so the fantastic. Best abusive relationship ever. Now, um, uh, Tony and Marin, I love, love, lo again, this, the whole show, if it was, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm getting into the whole cat, because if the show was just Midge's journey, it would be fascinating, and you've populated it with this whole other world of characters where you could veer off into any of you guys' stories, and it would be a completely solid show. And, and Tony playing this guy that you, you're, you are alive, your character is alive in this time when everything is changing and you have no idea that it's your daughter who's out there on the vanguard of everything <laughs> being torn. And then when you realize that's what's happening in season two and that, I mean, that, did you, how did you, pl you played it all with no dialogue. It's just, you're sitting there seething in the car. It was amazing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But you knew everything you would think you could he's, see. It. He's it a good seether. It was very late that night. Tony was actually very upset. With oh, okay. Us, so. Master seether. Yeah, I have a lot of hidden, you know, uh, rage. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, uh, I, I think I have I have the advantage, the distinct advantage of of being uh, the father of two daughters who are, you know, around the age uh, that Miriam is actually, mm -hmm. and um, and that's the sort of the interesting thing about. Uh, being a pair, especially to girls, because you know you 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 think you're raising them one way, and you think you sort of know who they are, and you know, and then they turn out to be completely some other people. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And the, you have nothing to do with it. Your <laughs> your impact was you know one tiny one <laughs> bit of one percent. And so and so and I and I kind of have lived that. Through, and I mean I'm happy to say I two wonderful girls and they're, 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 they've become amazing human beings in spite of what I did, <laughs> in spite of what my wife and I tried to teach them. And, uh, but, but so, so that was a kind of relatable thing for me. And, and, um, uh, but that is a favorite scene when I, when I do discover that this is a complete alien person. Uh, yeah. But then at the same time, you also have to deal with the fact that you're, when, Marin, when you go over to Paris, the, the, the moment when, my, my wife and I were stunned when they walked into your garret, yeah. and the way you're just sitting there, we're like, she is a completely different <laughs> character. Like, it was so amazing, that transformation. And then your face, when you realize, oh my God, yeah, and that was, that was incredible. But, um, You know, I have this line that Amy and Dan offered, which is, you know, what do you say exactly, Rachel? Something, I've missed you, Mama. And then Rose says, I've missed me too. And, um, yeah. you know, I'm of a certain age, and it's been a lot of years I've been in the business, but uh, to get to say a line like that, uh, that's a rarity. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. They, I really, really love the contrast between Midge knowing that I am taking some bold steps into the unknown and being kind of brash about it. And then Marin, you're, you're like, I, what's the big deal? Which is even more shocking for your character, Tony, because you're like, well, you don't even have the decency to acknowledge how changed you've been. You're like, this is totally natural. And that you're like, it's like, it's global now. The whole world is changing around you. You're, you're controlling nothing. Yes. It was hilarious. Yeah, and, and that... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I guess I'm just used to having the rug pulled out from under me. Uh, yeah, uh, that's the thing. I mean, that's the wonderful thing about having the opportunity to play this guy. Because when we first meet him, he is, you know, he's in a stable life, a stable career. His thing, you know, everything's in place. His daughter's married. You know, she, she, you know everything's set. So we're, I'm done. I basically get to just do my thing and coast. Right. And, uh, and, then, and then her marriage falls apart, that's a terrible thing. Then she just leaves and... Uh, <laughs> and we she, don't notice. She, we don't notice. Yeah, ex exactly, she don't becomes, even notice. Everyone is becoming a different person in front of me. Yeah. And so, yeah, so there's a slight... And Noah too. And, and even my son, and then I, Noah, who uh, played by Will Brill, you know, he, he's doing something I didn't know or understand. And, right. 
And so, you, you know, it's a humbling thing for Abe. Uh, very, very humbling. Now, Alex, you're... <laughs> my God. <There> we go. <laughs> you, what I love is that you are essentially playing an early 90s riot girl that has somehow fallen into a <laughs> space-time warp and is stuck in late 50s, early 60s New York. It's so... Is, is this... Is, is the character based on someone like you, you've encountered or, I mean, we're, we're, it's such a, a live. Can I backtrack for a second? <clears throat> sure. I've been working for 20 years and I have never been tied up and, and murdered on <laughs> There's So my, my theory Off, is, ladies, keep an extra 20 to 30 pounds on you. <laughs> I think when you're too, you're too cute and thin, you're, it's like fucking Bambi. You're just... <laughs> <laughs> just saying. Just saying. What was the question? Um, <laughs> where, like, where did, where, where did the character come from? Is it, it, it's, such, it's such a specific creation. Is this... Well, I, I've known Dan and Amy for like 20 years, I think. I, yeah. I, I, I've known Dan since Family Guy. He hired mm -hmm. me on Family Guy as a writer, and then I met Amy through Dan, and, and Amy she and I... She was the original Suki. Oh! And, and then she couldn't get out of her contract, so thank you for that. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it turned out okay. We found someone else. I don't remember her. <laughs> she, she's, anyhow, she's, she's a lovely girl, but go ahead. No, but I think we're, we're, we're similar creatures in many ways, and, and we have similar stories in some ways. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of, I think, Amy in Susie, and I think she used a lot of knowledge of me in there, but she's also very much my grandmother, a, a Holocaust survivor and a fighter, <laughs> somebody that, that is, yeah. yeah. You know, um, she's my mother. Uh, She's, I don't know, she's, she's, I just wanted her to be, um, to kind of exist within her own bubble and not really c conform to anything. Yeah, I love how you guys gave her, a, one of her constant sources of tension and frustration is she does not care about the stuff you're, that people are supposed to care about, which you realize is so, such a waste of time, especially for a woman. Like at that hygiene? Well, just, <laughs> but, well, <laughs> Just about a, a lot of the small talk social niceties that people are using to cover up a lot of weirdness. And you're like, oh, God, fuck this. You just, let's just talk about this. And, and that's where that frustration playing it is, is so fascinating to watch. Like, like you, you're the one character when you watch it, like, as great as this show is, I'm glad I'm not alive during that time because there must have been so much frustration and anger in people because of stuff that you couldn't. Talk about, you know? I mean, your, your character gets dragged off stage for talking about childbirth. Yeah. That's what freaks them out. Not the language, just totally. mentioning childbirth. Oh my God, you know, so that, it's such an alien I still world. I don't want to hear about childbirth. Well, it's okay. It's, <laughs> I'm I'm she's not kidding. I'm not kidding. <laughs> Bailey DeYoung was pregnant while we were shooting well, this season. <laughs> <laughs> and Amy wanted nothing no. to do with and it I until love the Bailey. baby was born. <laughs> I love me some Bailey. She was one of my bunhead girls, but I didn't want to hear a word about her. She said the word, like, gestation, and I was like, out. I was going, <laughs> I'm like, you know what? Tell, tell me when I can buy something for it, what it is, pink yeah. and blue, I'll buy a gift. I'm out. Uh, That's all I want to hear. I want to hear anything else. I was, so, oh. <laughs> I was gonna. I, I had two C-sections. They're pretty clean and nice and easy. <laughs> um, no, I was gonna say for for Susie, I actually think she she seems fearless and she seems just indefatigable. But the truth is, she's terrified, and I think she's she's very fearful. And I think fear is is the vanguard of courage. Really, she's she's so courageous because she's terrified, if that makes sense. So wow. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. Susie's another character that was stuck. Like, there's a 10-year period that we haven't even delved into of Susie's life. We don't know what happened in that mm -hmm. time. We find out things like she's actually a very fine classical pianist <laughs> at the top of uh, episode two in uh, season two. And then we never mention it again. And then we never mention it again. Uh -huh. <laughs> but she's another one that if my, if Joel hadn't have broken up with Midge, 
this partnership wouldn't have happened and this new chapter of her life wouldn't have been unlocked. So this right. series has always been about sort of like there was this big bang in the pilot when, when he broke up with his wife and it's rippling out on every character and yeah. Susie got caught up in it too. And it's all, it's all generally going to be for the good, but it's hard to suddenly shift your life, remember the things that you love, like, like uh, Marin's character is remembering Paris, and you, you're, you're tr everyone's trying to figure out who they are, which, which is right. the point. Well, and there's such well, a, oh, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say, there's such a good match and such an unlikely one, but as Susie said, you know, I mean, as, oh my God, as Alex <laughs> said. <laughs> It happens every now and again. Mm -hmm. But as Alex said, Susie is driven by fear, but it's something that makes her extremely courageous. She's grounded in a certain sense of reality based on her life experience. And Midge is unshakably courageous, unfathomably right. courageous, but naive. Well, um, there's also something in when you finally discover something that's important to you, and you, up until then, you had nothing that was important to you. You didn't give a shit. You didn't give it, you know, people weren't important. <clears throat> love wasn't important. Clothing clearly was not important. <laughs> but when you find something that's important to you, the fear of losing it or not attaining that goal is something that I, I think is the key of Susie because Susie is, has suddenly found something that is more important to her than anything else. And the thing about, the interesting thing about the partnership is Susie is the tough broad, but I think she's absolutely terrified she's gonna get back together with Joel, something's gonna happen, <coughs> the doctor's gonna come take her away, and suddenly this is not gonna become important to her, whereas there's something missing in Midge that <laughs> fear just kinda doesn't exist. She just yeah. sorta takes the knocks like, ah, oh, okay, I'm gonna register that one, fuck you, I'll be over here, and and Susie is like, sort of like, that's great, that's great, that's great, but like, you know, eyes on me, eyes on me, eyes on me, don't look over there. And I think that that's part of the interesting dynamic about these two women is that their, their need to, for each other, two women who really probably should never be speaking at all, they have nothing in common, but they're <laughs> not going to get where they need to go without each other. And I think it's, it's key, key to the series. Wow, wow, that's... <clears throat> Well, another <clears throat> really, really amazing element to the series is uh, Michael Zegan, and you're playing Joel Maisel, who, talk, I mean, talk about a character that is trying to figure out who he is, and is basically, the world is telling him, you're, you are not worthy of your own dreams, basically. <laughs> like, no, your wife is the comedian, and, you're not, and, and you have to play so much stuff internally, because you're collapsing half the time. It's fascinating to watch that, that <laughs> at the end of it is <laughs> so like how do you what what was the um <clears throat> that scene at the end of uh uh season one the last episode when you realize oh my god midge is doing comedy and she's amazing at it and you you say that line out in the street where you're that's that's my wife but you're also really hurt so how like how man like what <laughs> dude I, well, I, I, I love that scene. That's, I think that's my favorite scene of the entire show. Um, mostly because, you know, leading up to that, I think when, when, I first, um, when I first started playing this character, I sort of leaned into him being the villain. I, I, I mean, in the first episode, he's, he's the villain. And, uh, and then subsequently, you know, he, he, like, there's that scene in, I think it's uh, episode three, where he tells Midge that, you know, he's willing to give it another shot. And I, I, I told Rachel this, like, I was just like, people are gonna hate him, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and it's true, people hate him. Or, I mean, I did, I was on the show Boardwalk Empire and I played Bugsy Siegel who killed numerous people. <laughs> I, I shot a kid in the face and, and yet people always come up to me, they're like, love your character, man. <laughs> and, uh, and on this, on this, all I get is, you're trash. <laughs> <laughs> but, but no, but, uh, you know, that was, that scene, that's, it's true. I mean, it's, it's gotten less so recently, after the second season. But, um, I'm in therapy now. But, it, you know, that, that scene was the first time I, you know, it was so 
redeeming for him, even though like I never asked for Joel to be redeemed. I just you know, assumed he would just be the villain for the entire run of the, of the show. But um, I just, I love that scene so much because it, it does show heart and it shows that he still loves her. And yeah. uh, up until then, you hadn't really seen that before. But, well, you know, I, I'm, I just want to tell you something because I, I'm the biggest defender of Joel because I, there I know is, you are. I first of all, <laughs> it is the hardest part in this show because there's nothing harder than being the person that dumps the girl that everybody's going to be in love with. But I think Rachel has a harder part than than I. Do. <laughs> I, I disagree. Uh, because the thing is, what you what the audience has to believe for them to give a shit about Rachel. Now, now, de granted, she's delightful, but <laughs> I'm not I, 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 taking nothing away from from Brosnahan. But sh they have to see what she saw in him for them to care that she lost him. Well, I do take because off my shirt in uh, episode nine. There you go. Episode, <laughs> episode, we saw it. Episode, yeah, episode eight. <laughs> it's true, though. It's true, though. If they don't get what she fell in love with, then her being upset that she lost it doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, I mean, a lot, it, it's amazing how a lot of his... So suck on that, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> That's like God telling you to go fuck yourself. That was, whoa, wait. Um, but all of your bad behavior comes from being shown that your dream is not attainable to you, which has got to be, you are facing, in a weird way, the most brutal truth of any of these characters, which is, I have this creative dream, and I will never achieve it, and now what? What do I do now? And, that, and it, it's so great that you have um, Kevin and Caroline to play against your parents yeah. that get are so amazing. <clears throat> and what a and, and you see, what's thing. weird is you, that, that scene where Kevin tells you just get out, take the money and get out of this life and you realize he's a blowhard because he's kind of been wounded too. Maybe he went through something that, that Joel also went through. I don't know if we'll ever explore that, but that was such an extraordinary sequence. Yeah. Kevin, go. <laughs> go, go. Yeah. Go, go, go. Uh, yeah, listen, I tell friends who, who see me in this uh, wonderful show, as my friend, very funny comedian Bobby Sladen calls it, the, the amazing Mrs. Matza. <laughs> That's, That's pretty good for Bobby, actually. That's not yeah. bad. Yeah. I know him. That's <laughs> close enough. But you know, I, I listen. There, I tell them there's no way to fuck this one up. Honestly, the <laughs> oh, words, yes, the is. words, and the staging, and the every aspect of this show to to step into as a as an actor is such a dream. And you talk about those one those oneers, you know, the eight page oneer. You're right. When you, there's eleven moving pieces, you do not want to be the reason we're going again. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's horrifying. But but otherwise, honestly, the, the 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 scene after season two, people did talk about the scene between us. To me, certainly uh, a great deal about that moment in time where a son is told by his father, "You can do better than this." What the son does with that, but also the father finding a way to to make it stick, and to have to 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 fire him in a sentence, in, 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 right. to to set him free. And, and make better. Yeah, no, that was uh, an extraordinary scene. Now, Caroline, do you think Shirley is, <clears throat> as, a, as a character, is aware of any of this stuff going on, or is she? <laughs> no, no, <clears throat> no insight at all. <laughs> no idea. <laughs> Nor would I have approved of that conversation. <laughs> yeah, I did not run that one by. No, you. No. no, 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 no. Yeah. You play a very zen, self-actualized character, totally happy with the status quo. <laughs> That's what I say. With the least okay. amount of problems. I have never played someone so happy. Yeah. <laughs> she has everything she wants because she has, you know, home and hearth, and it's... Um, and food in her purse. Yeah, yeah. and food <laughs> in her purse. That's right. And the head. people we around her that she purse. loves. Do you have it's, pickles now? I don't have any with me. Okay. But, she, but I can get you son, some. And your son is at home with you. My son is yeah. at home with me. Yeah. I know. Caroline when my own son so hard was going show. to go me, away to college, I said that I was designing a new parenting paradigm where instead of making your children independent and self-actualized, you should make them insecure and crippled. <laughs> 
so they would never leave you. And then I got cast as Shirley. <laughs> you see, there's something to that theory. Yes. Of, you know, when you said, what will he do next? I, I think he's just wonderful. Whatever he'll do, it'll be perfect. Wow. Oh, oh man, that's, oh, oh my God, Shirley. <laughs> now, obviously you guys are working on season three. You're, you're, you're starting to form it, thank God. <laughs> and without giving away, actually here's a we can, way we can do it without any spoilers, because I, again, being the history buff that I am, seeing the little cameos, the Jane Jacobs, the Yoko Ono, um, obviously, Lenny Bruce. Um, Lenny Bruce, by the way, I, the, after the first episode, I showed, there's a very famous picture of when Lenny Bruce got arrested. I mean, you guys know this. And over his right shoulder in back of him was an 18-year-old that was arrested. In the, and it's George Carlin. Oh, yeah. oh, Spent the night in jail with Lenny Bruce. So I'm like, oh, are they going to work in a 19-year-old? Like, what, knowing what's coming up history-wise, where would each of you, if, if there was one historical thing that you would ha want your character to experience or butt up against, even in a weird way, what would that be? Like, can I just say, I, I would love to see Shirley wander into an Andy Warhol factory party by accident <laughs> and just watch how go. she would react to this. Like, that, wow. would be, that would be bliss. Be pretty fun. Yeah. Uh, oh. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I would love... I would love to see how Midge interaction, interacted with the birth, or I guess rebirth of the feminist movement in the, in the 60s and 70s. Yeah. Because I've said it before, but I, I don't think Midge is a feminist at this point. I think she believes well, very- Well, she doesn't think she is. Yeah, well, she, but, I think, but I think you kind of have to think you are to be one. Um, I, think, I think it's an active thing. I There's think a lot that, of women today who are feminists who are walking around going, I'm not a feminist. And you, you look, I, I don't know what the yeah. fuck you're talking about. You're a fucking yeah. feminist if you're talking about... <laughs> I mean, I don't, know, I don't know why you hate the goddamn word if you're talking about women and bitching and moaning and, and talking about, like, things have to get better and then saying, oh, but I'm not a feminist. It's like, ah, oh, fuck you, you're a feminist. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I think, I definitely think that, you know, like, if somebody were to say the word to Midge, she'd be like, oh, sorry, I don't burn my bras, you know? Uh, oh, and, yeah. And, I, and I'd like to see her bump up against the, the very loud and proud ones in the 60s and 70s. I'd like to see. That would be I'd bad. also like to see her drop acid. I think that'd be <laughs> <laughs> She would literally be no different. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so true. <laughs> <clears throat> <laughs> everything she sees is rainbows and colors anyhow. So. Yeah. <laughs> Tony, any... Uh... Yeah, well, Rachel kind of stole my idea oh, there. Sorry. because No, uh, that's right. That's Acid? Good. Yeah. Well, because... <laughs> Burning her bra? No, what? bra, the bra thing. Yeah. No, bra thing. <laughs> oh. Uh, Abe is much more complicated. No, uh, no, I think because <laughs> Abe is a scientist and, 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 and is into science, and, and, um, and, and I think it would be interesting to see I I him sort of tiptoe toward the whole thing, uh, you know, the Timothy Leary kind of thing. When, yes. when LSD was really not a recreational drug, before it was a recreational drug, mm. and it was a, uh, you know, a kind of a mind expanding and, uh, and it was a kind of a scientific experiment. And because he's, um, I, I, there was something we're, we're just beginning to learn about his past where he had this kind of more of a raw, you know, activist maybe uh, right. characteristic that, that maybe that, Maybe that that and science converging would lead him to at least have a conversation about that. Maybe. Oh, wow. Mm. I write that episode right now. Jesus oh my Christ. God. Just, we're not that Bunch smart. Bunch of drug addicts. Aren't we? <laughs> <clears throat> Alex, you're, you're all lucky because because uh, Gwenny says that uh, Gwyneth Paltrow came out and said it's all that's that's what she's into now. It's going to be gooped. Oh, really? Oh, good. Uh, psychedelics, that's what yep. she said. Like, I'm really interested in psychedelics. That's gonna, that's where the future is. What? Okay. Which good means word. on Goop, you can get your egg and some acid at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> it just Brand. means LSD is gonna become so expensive. It is. It's gonna be, <laughs> but it's gonna smell fantastic. Yeah. This is artisanal window pane that we did on this uh, <laughs> nice paper that we crafted. And uh, there's an illustration, I'm sorry. Anyway, Alex. <laughs> Oh, God, those are all so rich and thoughtful. Um, <laughs> I think it might be fun to see Susie bang Elvis. Bravo. Yeah. 
Bravo. You know, young, like young, firm Elvis. Oh, yeah. Oh. Oh. Fresh out of the army. Come yeah. On. Yeah. I think that would be nice. <laughs> Michael. Uh, yeah. Uh, all right, that was mine. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, well, I, 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 I mean, this, I just, okay, so going back to the baseball, I, I thought maybe it would be cool for Joel to be at uh, Roger Maris's 61st home run game. Um, it's not that funny, but uh, it was, <laughs> I think it was a monumental moment in baseball history. Um, I'd also, maybe he could be at Woodstock, that's kind of cool, or, yeah. uh, and, and maybe the, the Beatles could, could come play it at, uh, you know, he talks about wanting to start a club, maybe they could be his first act, and maybe it just <laughs> catapults him into fame. Um, and also, I think he, uh, maybe I'd, I'd like for him to see uh, Midge drop acid as well. Yeah. So. <laughs> oh, we have a theme. What about Rose? Because she still feels the pull of Paris, obviously. Right. Um, Is that going to be a factor, do you think? Or uh, Wait, say it again? I mean, she, you, your character still feels the pull of Paris. It's not. Pa yes, I think, right. I think she, maybe going to Paris with Alex's character, with Susie, um, and then having a menage with Elvis. No, oh, there you go. Yeah, Perfect. <laughs> There you go. with Roger Maris. <laughs> oh, kind of like, but, uh, but it writes I, itself. We're just giving yeah, these ideas I, away for free. <laughs> I, I hadn't thought about all these one. Yeah, I, I think, you know, like, was it in the, the, the key exchanges that happened at a certain? Oh, how about that, yeah. Tony? Oh, oh, key parties. Key parties, that was the right thing. Swapping? Yeah. Oh. The ice storm. Swapping, sudden, swapping. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. No, I, I, I like the idea. <laughs> <laughs> what did she say? <laughs> Wow. Who the fuck wow. are you people? Hint, I don't hint. know any of you. <laughs> it's literally sex, drugs, and rock and yeah, roll. Yeah, basically. It really is, yeah. <laughs> and wow. baseball. Let the, let the stallions <laughs> roam free. I know. Amy. Uh, Kevin. Oh, so uh, the place where uh, Moish has the, uh, the schmata business mm -hmm. uh, is a real place, and they still make, famously make suits for Clinton and, and Obama. So the fantasy is that Moish, I, maybe through Midge's popularity, gets to uh, make a suit for Kennedy. And he has to go to the White House to fit him, and he steals an ashtray. <laughs> Yes. I like it. Fantastic. I like it. And then, uh, <laughs> does, does he take Shirley with him, or what would or would you stay Absolutely. home? Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, I'm I, sort of interested in the intersection of what the civil rights movement coming up, and what's going to happen to the Jewish community and the black community, and how they're going to intersect in New York. Oh, yeah, that'll be your That's going to come up. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and now, how, how um, far ahead are you given scripts for episodes? Are they like... <laughs> <laughs> Well, we had our so first much hostility in that laugh, Tony. And we got the script at 11.30 p.m. the night before. <laughs> oh, my God. That's true. Wow. But usually it's a, it's a day earlier than yeah. that, but uh, okay. not much. And then how much... Um, input do you guys ha have on episodes? Have, had there been things where you're like, can we possibly change this a little bit? Really? You know, because you oh. get into your characters and they're... <laughs> you got my notes, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't... I, the truth is, I, mean, I don't know about you guys, I don't feel like we really... I don't think I've ever read anything and really wanted input. Um, right. The scripts come That's in... That's why she's my favorite person <laughs> <laughs> Um, the scripts come in and, and they're brilliant, even even when they come in a wee close to the deadline. <laughs> yeah. They've been they've spent a lot of time making them perfect, and and I I don't think um, no they they take care of that all on their own. And all, then what... all input is welcome, it's just not used. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> How, um, I how much- I let you have the fucking keys. <laughs> <laughs> you let me have That's a hat true. and keys and suspenders. There you go. <laughs> That's, <true>. That's three. <laughs> how, how long do you guys spend in uh, wardrobe testing out, out because right. my God, it's so, is, that, is, that a fa is that a time factor? Yeah. Yeah, that has yes. to be, right? 
Um, yeah, it's, it's a long time. You know, we build, and, and now we're building more and more of the different characters' costumes, but we started building almost all of Midge's during season one. So mm -hmm. our brilliant, brilliant costume designer, Donna Zakowska, spends hours and hours in, I imagine, in a room somewhere just filled to the brim with vintage Vogues, and she, um, she designs all these incredible, incredible yeah. clothes. And she's great. She's brilliant. Yeah. And, um, Gorgeous. yeah. And then uh, Eric Winterling and company bring the clothes to life. They build them, and we um, we go to Eric Winterling's and try on the clothes in muslin first, and then come back for another fitting and try them on in the real fabrics. And then we tweak and adjust. And then on the day, it takes about almost two hours. It from... takes for fucking ever <laughs> yes. to get a 28 year old girl whose skin looks like she swallowed a fucking light bulb out of the trailer. <laughs> I don't, I'm like, what? What the hell are you doing in there? She, she showed up Getting this morning, pretty. just wait, put a wig on her head, put some shoes on it. It's like, it's like hours and hours and hours. There's a lot of people involved, a lot of brilliant people. It's so a whole hours. village. It is but a it does take about though. two hours from yeah, the okay. time I sit and, down in the chair. And it is a character, hours. like, we'll do rehearsal in the mornings, and we'll be sitting there with Rachel, and then when she comes out in her getup, it's like, it, it's almost like, oh, you're kind of excited to see Midge Maisel. It is, it is a huge transformation. Yeah. I mean, it's like, wow. you're just seeing a different person. I think that helps. I mean, we have such a great crew of people that, as directors, we can point the camera almost in any direction, and every... Everything is finished. There's nothing beautiful. bad. Nothing's falling down or falling apart. <laughs> Everything is perfect. The colors are perfect. Um, Every single background actor dressed to perfection. Really? Yeah. It feels like we've time traveled. And, and yeah. we shoot a lot outside in New York City, and mm -hmm. it feels like we've time traveled. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that whole, the, the Catskill sequence was amazing because you, um, it's one thing to get the period clothing right when it's people that are dressed for work in the city, but to get casual wear and <laughs> resort wear just right, and Tony, you're... Uh. Mm. Mm. <laughs> I'm, actually, I'm actually wearing the romper under oh, the Oh, right, you got the so. romper? Take it off. <laughs> Did you know when, when they were playing um, the Chicken Fat song, when, when you're out in the dock, did you know that that would be the music for that sequence, because it no. was so perfect. No, I didn't oh, know. Oh my God. We didn't know. We, we figured that out later. We, 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 we chuckled in the writer's room for days about the prospect <laughs> of Tony wearing a romper like Jeff <laughs> And it was just like. But we're still and laughing about it. It was that <laughs> and the tomato juice that we were just yeah. yes. chuckling, 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 because who drinks tomato juice to refresh their palate? In so, a degree. In a oh. degree. Heat. And, and I remember because we, we, we went out to do that scene and we needed light and we had like 20 minutes. Oh, so yeah. it was you and me, and it was me going, jumping jacks. Do, uh, do, do, do something else, whatever you want. We were looking at this British exercise calisthenics thing from the 1950s. Yeah, we were, we were losing the light. Well, and, I could see that you were doing it like, it looked like magic hours. You're like, yeah, we've yeah. got yeah. this much time. Yeah. We're gonna, yeah. oh yeah, that must have supposed been. To look, it was he, supposed to be morning, but it was really that, you know, we were losing it fast. He exercised oh, wow. as fast as he can. <laughs> and the romper, you know, it should be in the Smithsonian next to Archie's chair. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Yes. Um, <laughs> if the show had spun off in that moment and they revealed that he's a superhero and that's his romp, the costume, that would have been, <laughs> would have been totally Romper rolled man. with that. Yep. Would so have been good. Right. Um, well, I am being given the signal that we are going to open up to questions from you guys uh, <clears throat> about the show. So we have some uh, microphones making their there, there, oh. uh, around the room. Oh, so uh, there. Uh, I'm there. going to uh, look for hands coming up and I will right. point to, um, let's start literally right front and center with her. I'm such big fans of all of you. The ensemble is perfect. Um, when the show ends, which I hope will be in many, many years, <laughs> could you all kind of tell us where you would like to see your character end up? I'd say dead. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, ultimately, ultimately. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> One day. I say alive. 
not tied Susie up in and a van. Midge. Wow, Susie and Midge. Um, wow. Wow, that's a that's a big that's a big question. Yeah, yeah I think I think I'm just going to speak for my character. You know, I think um, uh, fatherhood. I keep going back to this notion for Abe. Fatherhood has been uh, kind of a, kind of a, a mystery unfolding for him. So I guess what I would what I would want to see this guy go is, is that, that he has a relationship with his grandchildren and he gets to kind of, you know, <laughs> fix all the stuff that he messed up uh, and, and, and kind of gets a second shot at, at that, you know, at that, at that kind of a relationship. Oh, oh. sweet. That's nice. Oh. If they're still alive. Oh, God. What? Yeah, they're, they're still alive, alive. yes. <laughs> Um, okay, let's uh, find another, um, oh, uh, in the green uh, dress right there. Hi, guys. Um, just first want to say this is like my favorite show. It's so amazing and well done. Thank you for bringing it to life. Um, my question's for Amy. Um, so I'm a huge fan. I love Gilmore Girls, Bunheads, now to uh, Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. But a question I've always wanted to know is about all the pop culture references. Gilmore Girls and Bunheads, that took place in modern day, but... This is a show that took place before you were born, so do you just read and watch everything to pull out all these references? Do you have people you consult, or just how do you come up with all the amazing references on the show? I have no life. Uh, <laughs> I'm your life. <laughs> wow. Oh, we, um, you That's know, sweet. we, um, we're up there. I know. We, we, we consume a lot of information in our house. Yes. Um, there's, <laughs> like a, a serial killer basement filled with CDs that would terrify people. It's Tower Records is in our basement. <laughs> For those of you who don't know what Tower Records are. <laughs> go to fucking Japan, because there's still a Tower Records there. Anyhow. Um, uh, we, like, reading has always been important, and, you know, the, the weird thing about Gilmore Girls and pop culture is we never planned it like that. We sort of became the pop culture sh uh, show because everyone talks so fucking fast, and, and Lorelai and Rory were friends, young women existing in this world and sort of taking in information and like yammering about it. And we wanted to be able to talk about the music that we liked and the writers that we liked and the, the you know, and, and put down the people that we didn't like. It was, you know, <laughs> what are they gonna do? Come and get us, I'm on the WB. You can't even fucking find me, I'm in Burbank. <laughs> so, it, it, it didn't matter. Um, this, this show is actually different because it is, it is a period show. So weirdly you can make a reference here that we think is hysterical, but like nobody knows what you're talking about. It's 1959. <laughs> um, we do try to, um, you know, we, we actually do a lot of research on like, you know, when do they first say cocksucker? You know, and we have this, well, I know, you laugh, but I'm telling you, there's, there's timetables on these things. It's, <laughs> Deadwood is not actually accurate. <laughs> um, <laughs> for those of you who don't know what Deadwood is, um, <laughs> so old. Um, so I, it's, we have a, a lovely researcher um, that we picture who lives under the New York Public Library because she j is just quiet and smart and we picture that she lives in a hole in the ground and then we call her up and she's got like 20 masters and she knows everything and we say, hey, when did someone first come up with the words nutsack? And she's like, I'll be right back. And then she was like, <laughs> nutsack originated on, it's like, so we have a, a lot of, weirdly like a lot of that, that we researched because I actually just didn't know when they started using words like, you know, cocksucker, nutsack. I do now. But did you, did you know about the Dion quintuplets before? He knew, he knew Dion quintuplets. Dion quintuplets. Yeah. quintuplets. Yeah. Yeah. That one I had to look he's, up a lot. He's a, a terrifying human being. He's, he's, a, he's, he's never been to college. Uh, I don't count your junior college, so don't bring fucking Valley College up. It doesn't count. <laughs> Sorry, I know Brian Cranston went there. I get it, but it's not a real college. Um, so, oh so, uh, but but he reads everything in the entire world. So he carries around a backpack that is two years worth of magazines. There's five newspapers in there. 
there's four books, and the books he carries are like, you know, the, the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. They're not like, uh, you know, <laughs> me and Susie. You know, it's like there's nothing like light reading. It's all like, and the knowledge that he absorbs, you just sort of feel smarter walking next to him. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm the one who taught him about curbside baggage check-in, and he's <laughs> taught me about XTC and like all the wonderful things that have made my life. Uh, infinitely better, and and I, 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 if you're gonna get married, you gotta marry someone smart. You can't, you cannot hang out with a fucking idiot. Yeah. You just can't do it. I don't care how pretty they are; if they're stupid. They gotta go. And just, just a side note. I believe it was I'm Jesus Christ. Hmm? Who, Jesus Christ who coined cocksucker. <laughs> yes. 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 Uh. <laughs> yeah. Next question. <laughs> Stand near smart people, you get contact smart, apparently. Um, we're going to go way over there in the corner with their hand up right there. Hi. Um, my name is Jasmine. That's uh, right. So my question is for Ms. Hinkle. <laughs> Ms. Hinkle. Hi. Yeah, hi. Um, so I've seen, as you know, my mother and I are big fans of you. And, um, and we've seen a lot of the work you've done. And I feel as if this character has been something different you've done in your whole career. So I've, I'm wondering, um, how has this experience made you a better actress? Thank you. What a beautiful question. Um, I, I think it, it, <coughs> people were talking about it earlier. It really comes down to the words and the text that you're offered. And essentially, as Rachel said, um, we get perfect scripts that don't require us to actually do much more than memorize and embrace and work with each other and, and give over to our incredible directors, which are Amy and Dan, most <laughs> of the time. And so it, thank you for such a lovely question. And I, I, I just have to throw the credit right back at this whole group next to me and, and thank Amy and Dan for that. So thank you. Then. Right. Um, and let's go way over to that corner. Where in my shirt? <laughs> Oh my oh. God! Yeah. <laughs> Can you see that? Oh! Yeah. Wow. I just want to say how much I love the show, and one of the things I love the most is the interaction and dynamic between Susie and Midge. So my question is, for season three, will we see more of a backstory for Susie's character, especially learning more about how she got into the comedy scene? Amy. <laughs> oh, you're asking me? <laughs> and I, well, I wrote one fucking script so far. I don't know, you know? <laughs> sure. <laughs> we're, we're, um, we're, we're being stingy with Susie for a reason, because I also think that Susie is a character who, her, she, she's one of those people she feels like her history is not important to you. It's a need to know basis. If, if you know, the, the, to the end of their lives, Midge is gonna be saying we're friends and Susie's gonna be saying, we're not friends. We're not <laughs> friends. We, we did this thing, we made a lot of money, we lived next to each other in Park Avenue. Yes, I bought in the same building at you. That's not weird. It was just available. <laughs> we're not friends. It's New York, you go where you gotta go. So, now Wow. Um, uh, this woman right in the middle, right here. Yep, yeah, you. We're also huge fans. What I love about the show, and it's to the writers, and that it, it goes not, we watch it, my in-laws watch it, and our adult children watch it. And I think that there's not a lot of shows on TV that can go to multi-generations. And, and I love all the different characters, yeah. And when you, when you watch it, it's real. I mean, you feel like you're living it. I mean, I am Jewish, so I mean, it's like if my mom was alive, it, she would be dying with laughter every week. So I keep That's on doing good. it. It's amazing. That's good. We want to hear that. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. I mean, we wanted to make sure, I mean, the Mitch character from the very beginning, we told Rachel this probably the first time we met her, is that we wanted that character to feel not like, if a young girl is watching this show, not like, oh, that's my grandmother. We wanted it to be, oh, that's me. So we didn't want it to feel like a time capsule. We didn't play around with the colors and make them sepia tone or some weird thing. We wanted to feel fresh and alive. Because back then, they didn't know they weren't in the mod. They thought they were the modern thing. Yes. They were. So like, you don't think you're a vintage <laughs> thing in 1959 if you're living in 1959. So we want, and a lot of, I think a lot of shows about past events, the, 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 production accidentally makes it seem like you're looking through a thing at a thing and they don't put you in the action. We do everything we can to really put you into 1959, 1960. Yeah.
The woman right there with your, with your hand up. Y yes, you. <laughs> the woman with your hand up. Yes. Um, <laughs> Kevin, please, give me a break. Oh, my God. <laughs> Um, so my mom's in the audience right over there. She um, certainly so is. I really connect with the uh, Jewish mother relationship. Why aren't you sitting with her? Yeah, what yeah. the hell? <laughs> <laughs> she has the relationship. That is not a Jewish relationship. It's true. Um, so like, what's it like for the moms and like kids on the show, like playing that like Jewish dynamic? Uh, Alex, I think it comes down to you, right? Yeah, you and Carolyn. What? Caroline. Well, you mean you mean play in, in real life? I mean, I am a mom and I am Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a mom. I am Jewish. <laughs> it's like yeah, story. I'm not sure what, the, what you mean. You mean you mean what's it like to be with our fictional children playing? Fantastic. Incredible. <laughs> I, I have a son who's here tonight who I love. I've always also wanted a daughter, and I get one. And I get another son, so that's kind of a great thing. Aww. It's like Amy wrote the inside of the way I feel as a mother, but I wouldn't dare behave that way. <laughs> <laughs> but I certainly relate to it, I can just say. I can relate to it. So she's They're a very lovely cast to each other. They take very good care of each other. They're very gracious. They are very, um, they always show up when the other person's working to support, do off-camera dialogue, which if you don't know a lot about show business is very rare to try and get somebody to come in and fucking act your scene across from you. Usually you're acting across from the stand-in or somebody else, the script supervisor or some schmuck that would just walk through with orange juice. and. <laughs> And it's, it's, they're very, uh, I will say, I, I, the respect I have, and I, have, I respect nothing, but the respect <laughs> I have for this cast, um, you can have a wonderful script, you can have beautiful costumes, you can have a gorgeous set. If you don't have people who can bring it to life, you're fucked. Well, uh... What, I'm being told to wrap it up, and what a beautiful sentiment to end on. <laughs> um, another round of applause for the cast and creators of the marvelous Mrs. Maisel.